question was, why are different species give you different values? Right? That was your question? Yeah. Um, and again, what this is showing you is, is that the flame speed is, a, you're basically trying to take a very complex spatially distributed phenomenon and collapse it into a number, a velocity. And it's not, it's not a, once you really start to get highly stretched flames, what this is showing is the limitation of that of that simplification. I can't give you a, I, I personally don't have a great physical reason that I can give you of why the hydrogen is twice that of the enthalpy. All I can say is the reason that you're getting these different values, it's a manifestation of you're trying to take, you're trying to take a volumetrically distributed combustion phenomenon and collapse it into the velocity of a, a, a reference velocity and you're getting different answers depending upon different definitions. Okay? I know that wasn't a very satisfying answer, but again, like I said, I know that this is a little bit confusing at first because we're used to thinking flame speeds are gospel. And they're not. They're, they're, they're basically trying to take a complicated, spatially distributed problem, spatially distributed phenomenon, and collapsing it into a sheet, basically. And what's the speed of that, of that sheet? Um, and it, it's, a, it's, it's a good way to get started and to get started understanding about combustion, but life is, is much more complicated than that. Okay? Yes, sir? Um, so we define stretch as uh, 1 over A D A D T. Mm -hmm. um, so that obviously is time dependent. Um, so if you look at a flame like a Bunsen flame, uh, do we say that that's unstretched? At all? Uh, no, no, no. A Bunsen flame is, you can have steady stretch. It just has units of 1 on seconds. So kappa does not need to vary in time. Kappa can be invariant in time. But the, the flame's surface doesn't... What it's, well, yeah, yeah but, but remember, it's a Lagrangian elephant. It's not the actual flame surface. It's saying if at time t equals 0, you take the, the molecules, which happen to describe the flame, and you let the flow propagate them. Now you're no longer the flame. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Someone else had a question? Yeah, just yes, sir. They will. Is it just the case that comparing hydrogen and enthalpy, the behavior is different for the different flames? Or so you're integrating across the flames, but I mean, hydrogen and enthalpy is essentially half a longer than the different So, So I guess there's two things. First of all, presumably, if you could do these calculations, they would, they'll all collapse to the unstretched value. Um, and then you were asking why you get different values. I mean, if you plotted all the species, some of them would perhaps approach the enthalpy than others. So maybe is there something happening? Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. That is biasing. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. It's a good, good question. I, it, but again, I think it just goes back to this fact that you're you're trying to take a, a spatially distributed phenomenon and, and collapse it into a number, a velocity. But why one's high, why the Hydrogen's lower than, higher than the enthalpy. I, I can't give you a, a good answer. But if you, I'd l if you knew, figure it out, I'd like to know because, you know, it, it, it's a little bit unsettling. <laughs> yes, sir? So I was thinking, how does the curvature, I'm sorry, the kappa here computed? How is the, the stretch rate computed? Yeah. So there is a definition. Oops, let's let me try to use this. So the question is, how do you compute kappa for this plot, right? Specifically, through, is it also done with respect to a different way of computing? No, no. It's the same calculation. Same. It's identical calculation. We just use different species. But it's with the way the, these calculations are done are a post jet calculation. So it's it's kind of a an arc. A canonical combustion configuration. You know, you get flows that look like this, and then the flame will sit like that. You actually, get two flames if it's a symmetric. And um, so, if you plot the velocity contour, let's say, if you take the dividing the center line, u x as a function of x, you'll have some nozzle outlet velocity, and then it will, if it's a uh, 
you might you might recognize this is this is a human stagnation flow. The velocity gradient, if you set this thing up right, the velocity gradient will be nearly linear until you start to get close to the flame, and then gas expansion starts to cause the flow to accelerate. The velocity goes up like that. You get through the flame, so this is acceleration through the flame. Now you're through the flame, and then the velocity is going to go to zero at the symmetry plane. So that's the velocity profile. So if you work through that, usually what you try to do is you try to fit a straight line to this. And you can work out the math dux by dx is kappa or negative kappa. Yes? Sorry, one question. Uh, in, when you define the displacement speed, uh, can you ex again ex explain again what is SUC and SPC? Is it, I see from here it's the stressed, stressed consumption rate from this slot, I can understand, because... So which slide? Are this one, this one. So I see there you, I see continuity. Right here? Middle, Well, th no, this is a definition. So what you're doing is, so the right-hand side is a volume, so heat release rate integrated over a line, normalized by the difference in enthalpy. And then, okay, and so that's going to then give you a mass, well, when, as soon as you normalize by eight, what that gives you is a mass consumption rate, a, you know, a kilograms per, uh, a kilograms per second. Well, kilograms per meter squared per second. So in order to convert that to a velocity, you've got to normalize it by a density. Well, you can use any density you want. And so, and so it makes most sense that if you want to define a consumption speed with respect to the reactants, you just use the unburned density. Or, and so this is really, you can really write, instead of being, this is really a, a three equal signs. It's the definition of SUC. This is the definition of SBC. So the consumption rate with respect to unburned gas and the Again, this is a definition. So it's better written like this. You have this integral. This is the right-hand side. It should really read that. Right? It's, it's a definition. All you're saying is this is a, this is a, um, uh, consumption rate, a, a mass consumption rate. And in order to get it to a velocity, you've got to get, normalize it by a density. So in, in keeping with the spirit of the definition of SC collapsing back to its traditional definition for unstretched flames, we use the unburned density to define an unburned consumption speed. But don't, don't get hung up with why does it have to be that way. It's a definition. But the, the beauty of this definition is it collapses back. Then the, the unburned consumption speed becomes identical to the displacement speed in the limit of zero stretch. So it's a, it's a convenient normalization. Yes, sir? Yeah, so I, I don't know the reason off the exact top of my head. What this is, there's no reason that the dimensionless sensitivity to stretch should not be pressure sensitive. I mean, pressure is changing dominant kinetic roots. Um, very conveniently, most of these curves are collapsing. Some dominant root is, has, has changed in a way that changes the sensitivity. That's, I mean, that's, that's not a... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Anything else? OK, so I've, been, I've talked through a little bit of pressure, fuel stoichiometry. I just want to say a few things r real quick about preheat effects and stretch sensitivities. And in particular, I want us to start thinking about what happens in you know, things like aircraft engine applications or afterburner applications or duct burner applications, where you can potentially have very, very, very high levels of preheat. 
then you start to get some interesting phenomenon. Um, and if you remember, the whole phenomenon of ignition and extinction in flames is intrinsically a high activation energy phenomenon, right? So if you, you've all worked through perfectly stirred reactor problems, and you know you get the S-curve, right? And you get the S-curve when your dimensionless activation energy is high. So that's one of the interesting things about combustion is it's generally a high activation energy global phenomenon. Or g globally, the activation energy is high, which leads to this very distinct feature of combustion that you have ignition and extinction phenomenon, right? So if combustion didn't have high activation energy, I would not be comfortable right now knowing that I have gasoline in a jug sitting in my garage, right? But I'm okay with it. I'm okay with the fact that I have a jug of gasoline sitting in my garage next to the wall because I know that there's this thing called ignition, right? You, you have to give it a certain amount of energy for it to get kicked over, over that, the, the barrier for, us, for you to move from frozen chemistry, from, from frozen to equilibrium. Um, if, 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 you had an, if you didn't have that S-curve behavior, what happens is you get a little bit of reaction after one second and a little bit more reaction after 10 seconds and a little bit more reaction after 100 seconds. And given enough time, my house would be in flames, right? Um, but because of the S-curve, because it's high activation energy, I, I don't need to worry about that. Same thing happens with extinction, right? That, uh, you know, if you think about one of, the distinct, one of the distinctives about combustion is, well, in fact, I talked about it yesterday. I said combustion efficiency for all intents and purposes is basically 100%, you know, 99.99%. One of the, the features of combustion is you either have combustion or you don't. You don't get half. It's, it's, there's not too many applications where you only get half combustion half the reactants consumed. If something's going to happen, it goes boom, and it happens really quick. That's the ignition extinction phenomenon. But that's due to the fact that you have high activation energies and high dimensionless activation energies. And so what makes dimensionless activation energies high or low? Well, one of them is the global activation energy is high or low. The other is if your temperature is high or low, right? So remember, normally, generally, we, we normalize activation energy by RT, right? EA over RT. Um, activation energy, gas constant, temperature. And so when your approach flow temperature starts to become high enough, that effectively pulls down your, your, your global activation energy. And so you can, you can actually lose your S-curve behavior when you really start to get high preheat temperatures. Um, and so one of the ways that shows up is if you start looking at, at extinction stretch rates, very, you don't get the extinction phenomenon once your preheat temperatures become high enough. And so in order to illustrate that, here I have a calculation. This is a consumption speed. This is a displacement speed. So same flames. Uh, these are methane air flames. Um, and what we've, what we've done is we've done that stagnation burner. We take a methane air flame and we stagnate it against a hot product. The hot product temperature is, is indicated here. So if the hot product is 1350K, what happens is for this flame, as we strain it, the flame speed drops, it drops, it drops, it drops. Right there, you extinguish, right? And then that's the, the unstable part of the S-curve. But you can kind of visualize in your own head, you know, this is what the S-curve would look like. Uh, same with the displacement speed. It looks like that. Now, 1400K is kind of a magic intermediate number where you lose the S-curve. And, and what happens here is the consumption speed starts to drop. It really precipitously drops, but it never goes to zero. So the, the, the um, as you continue to strain it, combustion efficiency drops. The fraction of fuel converted into products drops, but it never goes to zero. Weird thing happens for the displacement speed. You can see it actually goes negative. This just goes to this point. The displacement speed is kind of a funny thing to look at. 1450K, the S-curve gets even more stretched out, and now you just kind of get this nice monotonic variation of burning velocity with stretch rate. Um, there's the displacement speed. And so, this raises, again, coming back to this flame stabilization problem. In general, flame stabilization intrinsically involves recirculation of hot products to continuously reignite the flame. And so what's really happening at that flame stabilization point in high velocity flows with, with, with significant recirculation is a really interesting phenomenon, is, is a really interesting but unanswered question, and as you can see from this plot, is that um, things don't really extinguish there. Um, so, anyway, okay, so last thing I want to say about stretch is I want to do one more caveat on stretch sensitivities of highly stretched flames. Now, 
if you remember, I wrote I, the flame speed we, I wrote before as a function of stretch, and, we, and I said, well, you can actually decompose the stretch into different contributions, kappa s, kappa curve, kappa a, kappa b, et cetera. But if you remember, I'd said for weak, for weak stretch, doesn't care, a flame doesn't care how you stretch it. All it cares is what's the total stretch. And that's how we could expand this equation in a Taylor series. Well, it turns out that for strongly stretched flames, that's no longer true. That flames respond differently to curvature than they do to, to flow non-uniformities and so forth. And just to illustrate that point, what I have here is a bunch of calculations for different stretched flame geometries. This right here, the, um, the opposed flow twin flame is the black line. That's this geometry we've been talking about. Um, a variant on the stagnation flame is what's sometimes called a tubular burner, which is a nice canonical configuration to study the, the, the simultaneous effects of hydrodynamic stretch on a flame that's curved. Um, that's, that's shown here. That's this tubular flame. Another way to stretch a flame is to have, its, is, is to have a, a cylindrically or a spherically expanding flame in time. Imagine if I take reactants, I ignite them at time zero, the flame is going to be propagating out into the reactants. And so that, the flame stretch rate is going to be changing in time due to the, the unsteady curvature effect we talked about before. And that's, these, uh, that's this geometry here. There's some details about initial ignition radius, and so that's why we get these different lines. The bottom line is, is that the stretch sensitivity is not, um, it's not, the stretch sensitivity of strongly stretched flames is not a mixture intrinsic quantity. It's, it's intrinsically a function of the geometry in which you place it. Because what happens is, is that um, the reason for that is, is that when you really start to get strongly stretched flames, the gradients within the flame start to become of the order of the flame thickness. And so different types of geometries or different types of, of, of um, yeah, di different types of geometries will have different stretch profiles through the flame. And so you can get different, different flame responses. And this just goes back to the flame that, to the fact that in reality, flames aren't sheets. They're spatially distributed regimes. And this thinking of them as sheets and attributing the velocity to them starts to become kind of a funny concept when you really start to stretch them. OK. So that's all I'm going to talk about stretch. Key points, just to summarize, is when you take a flame, you curve it, or you put it in a shearing region, in, in, a, in, a, in a flow with velocity gradients, the flame speed, the burning velocity can change. If you give it too much stretch, the flame can extinguish. And that's gonna, that has very, very important implications for the conditions under which you do and flames can and cannot stabilize, under the conditions under which you get blow off, because the flames in these high shear uh, regions will, will um, extinguish. So now I want to move into the next topic, which is edge flames. And um, so everything we've talked about so far, and if you've taken Combustion 101, um, or if you've looked in you know, pretty much any combustion textbook, they may not, it may not say it explicitly, but really you're treating the flame as, in essence, an, a, a, something that goes on forever. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. Um, and, and we treat the, and we, and we think about gradients normal to the front, but we don't really think much about gradients tangential to the front. Now, real flames have edges, and in the vicinity of the edge, there's going to be very, very strong gradients, not only normal, but also tangential to the front. And so it's a, it's a different animal. It doesn't act, it's, it's, it's not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a new, it's a new thing. Um, and so just, just uh, here I have a couple pictures. For example, um, you know, this would be a flame, a premix flame stabilized over a backward facing step. Well, the flame begins at this point. So it's sitting in a region of high shear, high stretch, which we talked about. But in addition to that, this flame has an edge. And so what that means is you're going to have strong tangential gradients. So it's going to change the structure. So what you know about premixed flame structure is going to be not necessarily apply to what's happening here. Um, if you have an ignition wave, so if you could somehow force ignition of part of a reactant and that ignition wave is propagating, what you're really looking at is an edge flame propagation problem. How fast is this edge moving out into unburned reactants? And the speed with which it's moving is not the flame speed, it's the edge speed. And the edge speed and the flame speed aren't the same thing. Um, another example would be if you have flame extinction. So for example, you have a really strong vortex. The, ex the stretch rate goes above the extinction stretch rate. You locally get extinguish extinction. You're going to have a hole in the flame. Now you have a flame edge. So now you have to in introduce edge flame concepts to understand what these, these holes are going to do. 
um, and so forth. So just a couple other things to note. I already mentioned this, that the premixed flame edge velocity is, is different from the laminar edge velocity. Simple example is that a laminar consumption speed is by definition a positive quantity. It can't be negative. But an edge velocity can be positive or negative. Right? The edge of a flame can be advancing into reactants or retreating. For example, this would be a positive edge velocity, this propagating ignition wave. This would be a negative edge velocity is if, this, if this hole is opening up. Um, another difference is, is that non-premix flames, they don't, they don't propagate, right? The flame sits where stuff diffuses into them at, at stoichiometric proportions. But the edge of a non-premix flame does propagate. It has, a, it has a propagation speed, the edge speed. Um, we talked about these triple flames a little bit yesterday. This is an example of a, um, of a propagating edge flame. So this is the non-premix branch. This would be the lean premix branch, the rich premix branch. And this front is propagating at a certain speed. It's an edge propagation speed. Now one thing, to now one thing you do have to do is you have to pay attention to observer reference frame to figure out if an edge flame is advancing, retreating, or stationary. For example, let's suppose this is a, that this flame is sitting here steady state. What's the edge speed of the flame? Positive, negative, or zero? This would be a propagating edge. Because what's happening here is that in a reference frame that's moving with the, tan the velocity that's tangential to the front, that flame is con the, the tangential velocity is continuously pushing the flame downstream. The, flame, the edge is continuously propagating into the reactants. And so in other words, let me just draw a picture here. So here was that example. So if the flow is doing this, you know, we can decompose the flow into a component that's normal to the flame and tangential to the flame. So with an observer that's moving with respect to the flow, this flame is, that flame, that edge speed is, 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 is positive. So this, one, in fact, would be a, po a propagating edge front, a, a edge speed. Um, the opposite example would be one like this, a retreating edge flame. If you take a Bunsen flame and you just, and you stabilize it so it doesn't really ever blow off. So here I have a, there's a, there's a, a ring of pilots around the edge of this thing. And this is a line of sight picture, so it's a little bit ugly. But basically what happens is, is that as you drop the equivalence ratio, the whole tip of this flame goes out. And what you get is basically this, this, um, this reaction front that, initiate, that initiates at the, at the, at the um, uh, uh, pilot flames down here. And it moves up a certain distance. And then you just get this hole. It just stops. Reaction stops. and then reactants are pouring out through the middle. That's what's happening here. But that would be an example of a, of a retreating edge, right? Um, let me just show you there. So if, if you took like a two-dimensional, like a, an OH plif shot of that flame, here'd be your, so the flame would look like this. So the flow has very strong tangential component. This would be a retreating edge um, in an and so what happens is, is that the reason the flame sits there, and it looks kind of steady state, is that the edge velocity that is moving like this, but the tangential flow is pulling it that way. So to a reference to a, um, in the lab coordinate system, it might look stationary. But to, to an observer moving with the flow, it's, it's, it's a very strongly negative, um, negative propagation speed edge. And these edge velocities can be huge. You know, a, a, a flame, a, uh, you know, flame, uh, propagation speeds, laminar flame speeds are on the orders of centimeters per second, meters per second. Edge velocities can be tens or even hundreds of meters per second. These flames can really move fast, these edges, depending on, on your different conditions. Um, oh, hey, here, here's, here's uh, Professor Chowdhury's data. This is another example of, uh, of um, flames with holes in them with, uh, where you can get these, um, these negative edge velocity flames. All right, so I, I think that's enough examples. Um, I hope everybody has a mental picture of what we're trying to understand here. So when we talked about stretch, we were focusing on premix flames. Here, this, this discussion of, of edge flames applies 
to both premixed and non-premixed flames. In order to understand a couple ideas, I want to work in detail through a model problem. And this is a model problem that, uh, from Buckmaster. Um, excuse me. Um, and we're going to make some, some simplifications, we're gonna, but it, it really nicely illustrates a couple basic ideas. And so if you imagine, um, here's the basic geometry to start with. If Ed, uh, Professor Law's combustion physics book, he starts out his non-premixed discussion by looking at something called a chambered flame. I don't know if, how many of you use that textbook to learn about combustion, but it's a nice problem because it's 1D. Okay, it's a, as opposed to looking at a jet non-premixed flame, which is multidimensional. And so it, the idea is, is that you have an oxidizer reservoir, and you have a fuel reservoir, and, and so somehow you have some sort of magic mesh here which fixes your, where your oxidizer concentration is known here, your fuel concentration is known and given there. They're some distance apart from each other. They're diffusing towards each other. The flame, a non-premixed flame sits here, and it's, it's a 1D geometry, and you can work out a bunch of nice ideas to start building intuition around non-premix flames. So this, this problem by Buckmester basically takes the same problem, but it says, imagine that somehow I could magically erase part of the flame. So now rather than it being a 1D flame, now I have a, a 2D problem. And what I want to ask is, what's going to happen to that edge? Will it sit still? Will it propagate into? Or will it retreat? So that's, that's the essence of, of Buckmaster's problem. Is everybody with me on what we're, we're looking at? We're going to spend the next half hour talking about this problem, so I want to make sure everybody understands the geometry. Now, we're going to call VF the velocity of this edge, of this flame edge. All right? And what we want, really want to do is we want to figure out what's the value of VF. Is it positive or negative? OK, so what we can do is um, here is a simplified energy equation, um, unsteady energy equation written in terms of temperature. You have a gradients in the z direction because, because of the, the fact that the flame edge, the derivatives in the z direction are not 0. So this term is non-zero. Then you have your, your transverse fluxes, which, which these basically control the, um, the 1D problem. And then we have Q would be the heat release per unit mass of fuel consumed by a reaction rate of fuel. We're going to just assume one, one step irreversible kinetics, use Irrenaeus kinetics to understand what the reaction rate of fuel is. So we're going to basically write the fuel reaction rate as we're going to approximate it by this. So some script B, which will be my frequency factor, times some stuff, times e to the negative EA over RT. So this is the model that we're going to use to analyze this problem. Now this is a two-dimensional, unsteady, nonlinear partial differential equation. No surprises, you can't solve it analytically. You got to start making some approximations. And so what kind of what Buckmaster's contribution to this was, he said, you know what, I can't solve this thing, so I'm just going to, this is, if you think about it, this is like a, um, a, a loss-like term. Um, this is taking stuff away from the flame. And, and he said, I'm going to approximate this term as some, I'm going to introduce some, some k. And I'm going to assume that this, that this uh, convective loss-like term is proportional to t minus tb, OK? Um, divided by some reference length scale squared. So you can see that this has the same units. This is like a, is, is, has, you know, a d squared t by dx squared. It has the same unit, units. This length scale s, is, it's, it's basically characterizing the, the length scale of your gradients. Now, what you can do is, the other thing that he did was he said, I'm going to assume, I'm going to seek solutions where VF is constant. So I'm going to, I'm going to look for traveling wave solutions. And if VF is constant, I can change my reference frame such that I'm moving with VF, and that's going to take out the explicit unsteady term. All right. So I, I don't have time to work through all the math, but I can just tell you that when you do that, um, you end up with an equation of this form, and, and now we've done some, no, some normalizing. So we've defined a dimensionless activation energy. We've defined dimensionless length scales, dimensionless temperature, dimensionless heat, heat release rate per unit mass of fuel consumed. We've also defined a Domkohler number because we have a chemical time, which is the inverse of that frequency factor. And we have a, um, a diffusive time scale, tau flow, 
which basically comes out of this, this length scale L here. And what happens is, is that this unsteady term, because if we're going to be moving in a reference frame, moving with the flame, instead of it being an unsteady term, this, turns, this term right here becomes this term right here, Vf times dt dz. It looks like a convection term. This term right here goes here. And then all this stuff on the right-hand side becomes this function of temperature and dom Kohler number. And that function is given right here. So stop me if, you, if, I'm, if I'm going too fast. I, don't, I just don't have time to work through this step by step. But I, I hope you can see the, the general sequence of what we're doing. We just took the, the energy equation, made this approximation for the transverse fluxes, reverted to a, a coordinate system moving with the edge, which we've assumed to have a constant velocity. And you end up with an equation that looks like this. And then this equation right here, this function of temperature and dom Kohler number, you get 1 minus, well, you, you can see that you get, this is basically the, um, the uh, it's like a convection term. And then you have here a, uh, a reaction term. A dom Kohler number, you can see the e to the negative e over t. OK, now, so just to, in order to build some intuition, let's assume that there's no edge. OK, so there's no z variation, and it's just this this 1D chambered flame that Professor Law has in his, in his book. If that's the case, everything on the left-hand side goes to 0. The solution of this equation is where this function of temperature and dom Kohler number is 0. All right, that's what we're doing on the next page. So the steady state solution with no z direction variation is where this function is 0. Well, I didn't have, I, if, if you work through the textbook, it, you'll see it, but I didn't have time to do it. But, this is basically an identical equation for a steady state well stirred reactor, which I think most of you will be familiar with. This, this equation should probably look reasonably familiar. You know, if you looked at Norbert Peters um, or Heinz Pitch's lectures, um, where you start coupling uh, convection and, and reaction processes in, in a well stirred reactor equation, this is the, the equation you get. And so what you end up with is this classic S-curve behavior when you have high activation energy. So for example, I have here a typical solution um, of this equation where I've solved for the temperature in terms of the dom Kohler number. And you basically get this type of behavior. You get the S-curve behavior. And again, it's S-curve because I've assumed high activation energy, 14. Um, and so what you end up with is this lower, non essentially frozen branch. You end up with this upper nearly equilibrium branch, um, there's some critical number that, some critical dom Kohler number, dA subscript i, to the left of that, you only have the frozen solution, right? It's, there's just, this, this dom Kohler number would correspond to an ignition boundary where it's possible to have, have ignition. Uh, you also have this branch to the right of it, it, it's only possible to have essentially near equilibrium solutions. Um, excuse me, I said ignition. This is where ignition occurs. This is where extinction occurs. Right? So as you would move, if you were to somehow cook up an experiment where you increase dom Kohler number, as you pass this critical point, bang, you get spontaneous autoignition and you pop up to this branch. Anywhere in this range between here and here, you could get forced ignition. Right? So if I was here and I could somehow kick myself up to that upper branch by, by an igniter or a pilot flame, then I could have forced ignition. Um, what I but the bottom line is, is that this region to the left, the flame doesn't, can't ever exist. The region to the right, the flame everywhere wants to exist. So what we want to focus on is this region in between where we can have either solution. In particular, what we're looking at is that we, what we want to look at is we know that near the flame edge, we're transitioning between those two steady state solutions. That upper branch is what's happening you know, here. That lower branch is what's happening down here. And what's happening in the middle, we get this new flame structure, which we're trying to understand, which is where those z gradients start to matter. But this flame edge is basically what, what you're doing at the flame edge is you're transitioning between that. It's a region where you're transitioning between the lower and the upper branch. So this is what we want to do is look at what's happening in that range. If we're to the left of it, the flame is just going to go away everywhere. If we're to the right of it, the whole thing's just going to spontaneously ignite everywhere, and I won't have a propagating edge. And so in particular, these, these three 
potential behaviors. I can have a propagating edge flame, a retreating edge flame, or a stationary edge flame. Does anyone have a question? All right. So what we want to do is we want to solve for this edge flame velocity. And so again, Buckmaster, he's a genius. And he, uh, although you can't analytically solve it, he was able to, to, to come up with some really nice results. And so what you can do is, whoopsie. Again, so this is our, this is, let, let me back up for a minute. Okay, so this tells us what, ha this is our baseline. This is what happens when you have no z direction variation. Now let's look at what happens. We want to focus on what happens when we're in this intermediate dom Kohler number range where we can have propagating edge flames. And now we have to turn on those z direction variations. So we've got to back, move back to this equation, which is really nasty. OK, so what, dom Kohler number, what, what Buckmaster did was he said, you know what? If I take this equation, I multiply it by dt dz, and I integrate it from all the way up here to all the way down there, I can really simplify it. And that's, and, and that's what he did. Um, that's, and that's shown right here. Because basically what happens is you multiply this by dt dz. This term actually, when, once you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity in the z direction, this diffusive term goes away and you just end up balancing this term with that term. And so you can actually derive this explicit formula for the edge velocity. All right, so let's look at this formula here for a minute. This, the, the bottom is dt dz squared, integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity. So excuse me for flipping back and forth, but let me just do it one more time. So that comes from here. I multiplied everything by dt dz, so I get vf times dt dz squared, integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, and that's this term here. That term went away. Then I take this term, I multiply it by dt dz. Actually, let me just write it down so you can see what we're doing. We have this function of temperature and dom Kohler number. You multiply it by dt dz. You integrate it from z equals minus infinity to plus infinity over dz. So the z's canceled. So this actually becomes, rather than having to look in physical space, we can integrate this thing in temperature space. So this becomes function f of t times dt. So that's, that's what happens. Um, and you end up with this. And so now what we want to really look at is this term on the bottom is always positive. So we don't need to even, we, can, we don't need to think about it. So what we want to do is figure out under what conditions is this thing positive, under what conditions is it negative. All right? So in order to do that, let's plot this function of temperature and dom Kohler number as a function of temperature. So in other words, let's back up, take this thing here, this expression. I just want to plot what this is as a function of temperature. That's what I'm doing here at different dom Kohler numbers. So here's the temperature. Here's that function. And by the way, you can see the three solutions. One, for a given dom Kohler number, you can see the three solutions. One, two, three, where it, it equals zero. That was the steady state solution that we showed you up here, right? So when you're in that intermediate dom Kohler number regime, you have one, two, three solutions. If your dom Kohler number is too low, you, don't, you only have one solution, which is the lower branch. If it's too high, you only have one solution. That's up here. But in the middle, you get these three solutions. So you can see that there's three zero crossings. But that's, the zero crossings are the solution with no, with no z variation, with no edge. Once you include the edge, what we want to know is what's the area under this curve. Okay? The area under the curve when you integrate the temperature between the reactants and the products. All right. So what you can see is happening here is, is that Let's say the dom Kohler number is 1,000. What's the area under that curve? Positive. So what does that tell you about the edge, edge speed? This integral then is positive. So, you, so this would correspond to a positive edge speed flame. What about this 580 case? Negative. That would correspond, so that, you know, again, you can see this line. This critical value is at what? 200, 300, 400, 5, it looks like around 520 or something is the extinction value. So if your dom Kohler number gets start getting close to that extinction value, negative edge velocity. So what we can do, and then this, it turns out I just 
iterated and I magically found out that this value of 700 was where the value, that the, the area under the curve was exactly zero. So that's where the um, edge velocity is zero. So what, from, what we can do from this is we can further divide this intermediate regime where you can have either essentially equilibrium or frozen solutions. You can further divide this region up into two other regimes. Um, you can divide it into a regime basically to the left, for, well, for this example of 700, between 520 and 700, VF is negative in this green region. This tan region, VF is positive. Okay? So what this means is that this bistable, you have, these, you have this, these two possible solutions, and what this tells you is that depending on where you sit in that space, your edge velocity can be either positive or negative. So if there's some range of values over which if you have an edge, you're toast. <laughs> That's what this means. Basically, let's, let's, just, let's just think about what this means here. Since, let's, say, let's take a value of 580. Again, don't get hung up on these numbers. That's just what they turn out to be for this model problem. But let's assume that I'm somewhere in this green zone. All right? It is possible, this solution, there is an upper branch. It's possible to have a healthy and well non-premixed flame that persists forever with no edge, OK? It's possible to have a, 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 um, a one-dimensional steady state solution in this dom Kohler number range. But because the edge velocity is 0, what this tells you is, is that if this flame somehow were to get an edge, what's going to happen? It means this is going to happen. The flame is going to go away, right? It also tells you that if you're in that tan region, if the flame has an edge, this is going to happen. It's going to eventually propagate into the whole, whole region. So now, this kind of gives you some insight into, like, for example, ignition problems. So it's, you know, it's well known that the, the, the range of conditions over which you can get a flame are much broader than the conditions over which you can ignite a flame. And so this kind of gives you some insight, because what it tells you is that, let's suppose you pop the igniter and you get a flame. If you could somehow magically make the flame be everywhere where it's supposed to be at a, at continuously with no edge, the flame could exist. But because you intrinsically give yourself a flame with edges, that edge flame will then collapse back on itself and extinguish, and you, get, you can get a failed ignition problem. Um, and so just to further expand on this, what this tells you is that there's this there's this new critical dom Kohler value. I call it dA sub v here. It's the, it's the edge of this line. So there's only one value where the, the edge velocity is 0. So really, you're not going to have 0 edge velocity. They're either going to be positive or negative. And if your dom Kohler number is greater than 0, the flame edge is basically an, an, an ignition front. It's, it's, it's an auto ignition front. And that flame is zinging along. It can go really fast. Um, if the dom Kohler is less than dA sub v, then that edge is an extinction front. It's going to propagate away, and you're going to lose, you're going to lose the entire flame. So I hope this kind of gives you a feel that you get, you get, as soon as you have a flame edge, you get this new set of processes that doesn't happen when you have a continuous flame. So now, so that's Buckmaster's model problem. I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to move away from his model problem now and, and, and just talk a little bit more about edge flames and show you some data and some computations here. So let's first talk about the structure a little bit. Um, these are some calculations from Joel Dow uh, of, of some edge flames. And in general, what the edge flame looks like is, is different depending upon how, whether it's an advancing or retreating front. So this would be an advancing edge flame. And you can see it looks like a triple flame. All right. By the way, the way he did these calculations was he just since this is a non-premixed edge flame, you vary the, um, the transverse gradient. So you're basically varying the scalar dissipation rate. So VF greater than 0 would be a relatively low scalar dissipation rate. You get a propagating front. You can see here, this is a, um, a uh, retreating edge. You can see you actually lose the triple flame. You only have the middle branch. And in general, and, and by the way, sometimes people wonder why you don't see more triple flames in real turbulent combustors. And this is probably part of it because if there is a flame edge in the first place, you had extinction, you lose those, um, you lose those branches, these two branches here. But um, these, uh, this flame would correspond one with very, very high scalar dissipation rate. And you basically extinguish those, um, the weaker 
lean and rich premixed fronts. Um, okay, so premixed edge flames. These are pretty typical images of premixed flames. They oftentimes kind of have this hook-looking structure. This is, a, this is a measurement. This is some data taken by Paul Ronnie. By the way, the way Paul Ronnie has, has um, probably the most comprehensive set of experiments on this. The way he does these experiments is imagine if you take a, um, that stagnation burner that I showed you before, and you cant the burners just a smidge. Um, let me just draw a picture here. So rather than making it a perfectly 1D problem, imagine that you cant this thing, so you just rotate this up. You rotate that up, so I, now I didn't cant it. Let me cant it. And you have these jets. What you end up with is that the, um, the strain rate is decreasing in that direction. What you can do is it's a nice way to get a, uh, you can create flows with a flame edge. So that's where that picture comes from. It's a, it's a geometry that looks like this. Um, and so, you know, he can, and then by, you know, he would do some, some neat stuff whereby he would, um, he could take a nitrogen, um, a nitrogen, uh, wand, yeah, yeah, and blow it in and extinguish the flame and then watch the flame propagate back and measure the edge velocity. So some really neat stuff. Um, some really cool data. So that's where this is coming from. These are some pictures also from um, Ronnie's group. You know, this would be a, these are non-premixed flames here. This would be a weakly stretched flame, a uh, much higher stretched flame. And you can see, again, you, here you got that triple flame structure there. There you don't have it. OK, well, let's talk a little bit about that edge velocity VF. Um, so first, I want to talk about gas expansion effects. The first gas expansion effect you can understand from what we talked about yesterday when we talked. If you remember, I specifically mentioned triple flames. And I showed you how that, that when you had a, a, uh, a curved non-isothermal front, that influenced the approach flow velocity. And in, in fact, caused the approach flow to, to decelerate. I kind of called it, I said flames kind of part the waters in front of them, which is why flashback and is, is such an issue or why flames can trigger vortex breakdown. So this would be a computation of a triple flame, reaction rate contours here, streamlines, and you can see this divergence effect. So what this means is that if this flame is, that if this leading edge, which is basic, propagates at some speed, it's actually going to be, be able to, to sit in a higher velocity flow than you might imagine because the flow is, if you, if you try to characterize the flow by its bulk approach velocity, its local velocity that the flame is propagating into is lower. And so that makes the edge velocity higher. Um, and so if we sigma rho, if we call sigma rho the uh, gas expansion ratio across the flame, defined here, um, generally edge speeds increase with density rate. Non-premixed flame edge speeds increase with density ratio across the flame. This is um, some data from a, a paper by Roosh et al. This is an, an, these are, I believe, some computations uh, plotting these are not edge velocities. Here, delta U denotes the deceleration of the flow in front of the flame, which is induced by this gas expansion effect. That's what delta U means. Um, and, this just show, and this just shows you this, this gas expansion effect. Um, and uh, this paper here by Roosh, they derived a scaling which basically says that the edge velocity, as the dom Kohler number goes to infinity, should be proportional to the flame speed times the square root of the density ratio. And here's that scaling of theirs. Um, OK, so, so density ratio is important. The other things that are important are dom Kohler numbers, as you might imagine. Uh, heat losses are important. I'll talk about those in a little bit, and as well as a whole bunch of other stuff. There's a lot of literature on this. I don't have time to go through most of it, so I'm just going to quickly show you a couple, a couple-ish things. Um, tell you what, it's 4 o'clock. Why don't we take another, uh, we'll, we'll reconvene at 4.10 and uh, go from there.